Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. Epilepsy is a very diverse disease and it's a very common disease. So 1% of people will at any given time have it. The hallmark is, is that there's events of loss of neurologic control that occur at times that uh, you're not expecting or can't predict. And if it happens more than once, and that's what epilepsy is. Epilepsy is a central nervous system disorder causing seizures or periods of unusual behavior, sensations, and sometimes loss of awareness. Treatment for epilepsy can include medications or surgery to control the seizures. Thanks to advances and new minimally invasive techniques, surgery is an option for more patients than ever before. The game is much different now. We've really improved the outcomes for patients. There's a lot of patients that are seizure-free without side effects from the surgeries. I think it's important to not be scared of thinking about doing some of these things because they can have uh, substantial and meaningful impacts in, in people's lives. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Jason Howland sitting in for Dr. Helena Gazalka. Epilepsy is a neurological disorder in which brain activity becomes abnormal, causing seizures or periods of unusual behavior, sensations, and sometimes loss of awareness. Anyone can develop epilepsy. Epilepsy affects both males and females of all races, ethnic backgrounds, and ages. Treatment options can include medications or surgery and advances in treatment means now more than ever, there are options to help patients. Joining us to discuss those options available for epilepsy treatment is Dr. Jamie Van Gumpel, a neurosurgeon at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Van Gumpel, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jason, so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right, we've got a lot to talk about, so let's start with the basics. Epilepsy is not a one-size-fits-all disorder. There are different types of seizures and different causes. Can you start by helping us understand what epilepsy is? Yeah, epilepsy is, as you point out, it's a very diverse disease, um, and it's a very common disease. So 1% of people uh, will, at any given time, have it. And what the, t the hallmark is, is that there's events of loss of, con of um, neurologic control that occur at times that uh, you're not expecting or can't predict. And if it happens more than once, so it has to not just be one event, that's what epilepsy is. Now, fortunately, a lot of patients can you know, see a neurologist, figure out what the cause is and be controlled with medications. That's about 60% or 66% of patients. But there's another you know, whole 33% or a substantial proportion that fail that could be controlled by medications. But realistically, it's a disease that has a bunch of different causes, especially if you're a kid or an adult, there's different reasons that one might have it. And it's a very complicated problem. Um, and it's a very difficult problem uh, for patients that have it. So how are doctors able to personalize epilepsy treatments? And, and why is that important? Medical doctors or, or, the, or the neurologists have a lot of different medications that may be beneficial to the type of epilepsy that people have. Um, but after that, once, um, once people fail medical uh, treatments, surgeons have a plethora of, of treatment options that we work in partnership with our neurology and neuropsychiatry and radiology colleagues to help figure out. Um, you know, for a lot of people that come to us, our hope is to just see them once or not just once or just one episode of care, um, diagnose where these things are coming from. And in certain circumstances, surgeons can tailor the approaches to stop the epilepsy, either by doing craniotomies and removing it, um, which was the only tool we used to have in the tool shed. But nowadays, we can also do things like use lasers to treat them. We can stimulate that area of the brain to treat seizures. Um, and we're doing a lot more to keep people exactly how they were before to get rid of these things. So if patients have not been seen at an epilepsy center or if it has been a while, what should they know about epilepsy treatments that are available today? Yeah, epilepsy treatments are changing so rapidly right now with the introduction of robotics, stereotactic techniques. So what does that actually mean? Well, before there were, there were only so few of techniques that we could have the diagnosis. You know, they put the buttons on the scalp to try to figure things out. We used to actually put some on top of the brain uh, and a very few through it. Now we actually put very, very small electrodes directly into the brain in a way that we can reconstruct where seizures are heading and going. 
that's been very beneficial for understanding treatment options for patients. And these things, although available in Europe for you know decades, in the United States, really the last decade they've been available. That's something called stereo EEG. Um, you know, and and on top of that, some of the things that we have to do th- do treatments for epilepsy, we just didn't have a decade ago. So there's ways that we can make, you know, I want to say incisionless, but that's not necessarily true. But a small stab incision, deliver a laser catheter and treat the same tissue that we'd have had to use a large craniotomy before. I think some of those big treatments in the past have scared patients away um, from what we have to offer. In fact, we have a trial open at at least at Mayo Clinic right now that involves no incisions and using MR guided ultrasound, ultrasonic energy to deliver energy inside of the head to actually treat some of these epilepsies with ever, ever actually going in your head. Wow, that's fascinating stuff. Um, uh, you talked earlier about uh, tools in the toolbox uh, to treat epilepsy. So uh, let's start with talking about the whole toolbox. So first off, uh, medications, um, and I'm assuming those have been around for quite some time. Are there new medications that that are coming up that are they're doing a better job of, of helping uh, patients with epilepsy? Yeah, I think that's, uh, so you said medications around for a long time. We, when I was a medical student, we learned about six or seven of them. Since then, there's almost 30, and there's new trials coming out all the time. And uh, I think that's very fortunate for patients because there's, there's an ability to be able to modify those medications um, and, and avoid actually having surgery in some circumstances or avoid side effects from them. We're also learning that some of those medications are actually very beneficial to some of the things that we, we use surgically to treat patients with epilepsy. Sometimes we install stimulation devices that are actually helped by some of those medications or lower doses of those medications. So that's certainly rapidly advanced. And if you haven't seen your epileptologist at a tertiary care center, there might be something new that uh, they can help you with. So next tool in the toolbox, and you mentioned it right there, um, brain stimulation. What exactly is brain stimulation? Yeah, so, you know, brain stimulation has been around for a long time, at least trying to treat areas um, uh, without cutting them out. So in movement disorders, which is not what we're talking about here, but things like Parkinson's disease or um, tremor, we used to actually kill tissue, but now we just put small little probes in the head and deliver electricity. And it does the same thing. It eliminates the tremors without causing a lot of side effects and it's reversible. Now that kind of technology that's been around for decades is really, uh, um, being utilized a lot in epilepsy now for a variety, in a variety of different ways. One of which is called open loop stimulation, which is how the DBS procedures are done for movement disorders, in which we deliver electrodes to different parts of the brain, most often the thalamus, and give currents that the patient can't feel and don't typically cause side effects, but have a substantial improvement in seizures. That's with a, that's called deep brain stimulation. That's somewhat similar to what vagal nerve stimulation does. There's also something that's, you know, to use a technical term, closed loop stimulation, but it's a lot like a pacemaker in which a pacemaker detects bad heart activity and actually paces the heart. There's actually a device just like that that goes into the brain that detects bad brain activity or seizures and delivers a stimulation that stops the seizures to directly treat them. Uh, both of those uh, types of devices, um, you know, are just the the newest kid on the block, and those have only been around for one, five years, and the other a decade. But now there's a bunch of different devices coming down the pipeline and new, uh, new targets, things like the Pulvinar, things like Centromedia. In fact, before generalized epilepsy, we did not think could be treated in this manner. There's a large national trial now going on for things uh, for idiopathic generalized epilepsy. It's called Nautilus through Neuropase. And uh, we have a lot of hope and, and actually scientific evidence that's going to help a lot of patients. So with the, with the uh, brain stimulation, uh, are, are the electrodes under the skin and do they sense uh, perhaps like when a seizure is 
is going to happen and then it stimulates the brain? How does it work? Yeah, so um, we do put electrodes in that go through the skin for monitoring. And we should talk about that, how it, the advances and and how we diagnose these epilepsies. But the ones that we just talked about are under the skin. There's one, the, the device is in the skull, the other one in the chest. Um, but there are devices out there that respond to seizure activity and treat it. And in fact, there's also devices, some of the other older devices that people may have like VNS, some of those actually respond to an increase of heart rate that is caused by a seizure and gives extra stimulation to stop that. And, and we have a lot of reason to believe that there's gonna be a lot of more um, these, of these types of treatments out there that respond to having a seizure and hopefully keep the patient awake. In fact, we're uh, involved here at the Mayo Clinic with, in a trial that's really interesting in that it's not actually trying to stop the seizure. What it does is detects the seizure and then it actually goes to the inside part of the thalamus called the CL nucleus and it stimulates it so you can't lose consciousness during the seizure. We're very excited about what that might be for the future for patients. Fantastic. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about minimally invasive treatments, another tool in the toolbox. Uh, you mentioned laser treatments, also the uh, MRI-guided ultrasound. Uh, talk a little bit more about uh, how those treatments work. Yeah, I think, you know, we're always trying to have the goal of having the patient be as good as they can, both uh, looking <laughs> after the procedures and, um, and have, you know, less headaches, less side effects from treatments. So through the wonders of technology and engineering, we can actually take care of tissue or remove tissue without making very big incisions any longer. Um, we think there's, this is also, so a lot of these minimally invasive techniques are coupled with real time imaging, especially with uh, magnetic MRI. So an MRI imaging in which we can monitor structures to try to keep them safe. So we can reduce the chance of having complications with these procedures. Or for instance, um, if we have a uh, seizure onset area that's close to your hand movement area, we can insert a catheter, we can treat right next to it, but monitor the area that you can, you're can you using to move your hand so that it won't be damaged during that treatment. And then uh, lastly, the last tool in the toolbox is of course surgery to remove uh, part of the brain that's causing the seizures. Uh, who can be helped with epilepsy surgery and what is the goal of surgery? Yeah, so in patients that we, so. Surgery can be a, something where you go to sleep and not get many incisions, but we still have a lot of the older procedures out there, and we're, we're actually a lot better at predicting who will and who will not respond to those therapies. I think when these therapies came out in the 80s, we were just kind of taking everybody and doing these big procedures, and some patients weren't seizure-free, unfortunately, and some patients were. We're becoming much better at selecting the right patients for those procedures. So in fact, in the most common type of epilepsy that we treat, temporal lobe epilepsy, we still very commonly do a craniotomy, which is an opening of the bone to get down to the brain and we remove the right temporal lobe because in most patients, they can do very well with that go on and be seizure free. On the left side, rather than doing that bigger procedure in, in a lot of patients, we don't do that because they may suffer from some issues with uh, memory after that. We, have, we can replace that procedure with a laser ablation procedure, for instance, that would preserve that memory that we would have lost in the past. And so sometimes we're using the old school techniques in different ways in order to still get the same success rates where they were really good and using some of this newer stuff to kind of get around some of the problems we were having in the past with some of the, um, the larger operations. But those, those craniotomy is not a bad word. It actually is super helpful for patients. And those are some of our most happy patients because once that's done and they're seizure free, they no longer have to see me or see an epileptologist. They're no longer on those medications that may be, you know, causing them to be drowsy or cause a tremor or something like that. Yeah, I think there might be a misconception out there that uh, craniotomy is high risk and, and difficult, but uh, it sounds like uh, the field's definitely evolving and and especially with some of these new minimally invasive techniques. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it, everything is changing so rapidly right now. I was just, uh, we just had a, um, uh, a national meeting 
talking about how rapid the advancements been over, over the last 10 years. In fact, the most common way of, men, of monitoring the brain, SCEG, which is that, which is a intracranial diagnostic procedure, that's went from almost not being done anywhere in the United States 10 years ago to almost every center doing it across the country. And it's cut the uh, complications rate down by, al by almost 80%. And so it's really opened the door to understanding people's epilepsies. And then all these other techniques weren't even around a decade ago. So again, if you have epilepsy and you've checked in with a center maybe 10 years ago, um, or you have people that you've heard have had issues with epilepsy surgery, I just would like to emphasize that the game is much different now, that, that we've really improved the outcomes for patients. There's a lot of patients that are seizure-free without side effects from the surgeries. And um, I, don't, I think it's important to not be scared of thinking about doing some of these things because they can have uh, substantial and meaningful impacts in, in people's lives. Well, I'm gonna have you uh, whip out your crystal ball now. What do you see is on the horizon for uh, seizure prevention, prediction, and treatment? I think because we are treating more and more of these, we're getting smarter and smarter. So things like artificial intelligence or machine learning to help us understand what an individual patient would be the best possible outcome for them, uh, which, I'll, which will lead to patient standardization and improve the outreach of these treatments will be important. I think we will continue to move more and more towards less um, removing less and less brain. And in fact, I do believe in, a, in, in decades, we'll understand stimulation enough that maybe we'll never cut out brain again. Maybe we'll be able to treat that misbehaving brain with electricity or something else. Maybe sometimes that's uh, drug delivery uh, directly into the area that'll rehabilitate that area to make it functional cortex again. That's at least our hope. You know, we want to actually make people better with these surgeries, not worse, of course. And I think that all those things are coming. There's companies working on that stuff. I think there's actually, we're actually also thinking about uh, with these stimulation devices and some of the surgical treatments, treating some of the side effects directly of epilepsy itself. Like patients often have depression with uh, epilepsy and it might be possible, to, I don't wanna say to kill two birds with one stone, but to treat two problems with one treatment, stimulation for epilepsy and for depression. And um, that might help a lot of patients. You know, I very commonly talk about uh, the way electricity in the brain works is all the medications people take for, psych for psychiatric disorders like depression or epilepsy, or epilepsy, which is not a psychiatric condition. They're just aimed at changing the way electricity runs around the brain. And if you take enough of those medications, I think in a lot of circumstances, you would treat the seizures or your depression, but unfortunately, those medications may make you so drowsy or they may stop you from breathing. And what they're doing is, again, just modulating these circuits or changing the, the way electricity is running around. And we can do that directly by interfacing with the anatomy and really avoid some of the side effects from these medications. And I think that's, I think that's really where we're headed with this. Fantastic. Well, we are just about out of time, but uh, I've got one last question for you. Who should ask for a referral to an epilepsy center? So anybody that has uncharacterized events or even characterized events that is being treated with a medication that's continuing to have events. If you've been diagnosed with epilepsy and the medical treatment is working for you, you should stick with that unless you're having side effects from it. You can either talk with your primary care physician or your at-home neurologist. There is a, a plethora of, uh, of tertiary, what we call now quaternary um, treatment centers that are more than willing to give secondary, uh, secondary opinions to patients. Um, and there are certainly great places to understand how to get to those. There's also support through the Epilepsy Foundation for patients that are financially unable to travel. They very much support people to come up for second opinions and they will sometimes also help with some of the treatment costs, uh, as will the institutions that you're going to. Um, so I think it's really important that if you're having events that are uncharacterized or, or, you're, or you're having epilepsy that's continuing despite medication trials, especially at least two separate medication trials, 
that you seek a, a, a second opinion about what could be potentially done with this. And I would recommend touching base with that second opinion almost every five years. Well, our thanks today to Mayo Clinic neurosurgeon, Dr. Jamie Von Gumpel for joining us today to discuss treatment options for epilepsy. Thank you, Dr. Van Gumpel. Thank you so much, Jason. Have a great day. And thank you for joining us on Mayo Clinic Q&A. Have a great day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.